Now tonight, Father, as we've gathered here, there are those that stand in need. You've heard these requests, Lord. You know, Lord, what each particular case and need is. So we just lift to you each one asking, Lord, that you would extend your hand of grace and mercy, your hand of healing, Lord, to touch and to supply each need according to your own will and purpose. We're grateful tonight, Lord, for this privilege again to be able to come as a Christian family, to have fellowship, to lift our voices in song and praise. We're thankful tonight, Lord, to have a place where we can come. Lord, to receive from you spiritual food that is uplifting and beneficial to our soul, something, Lord, that is able to help us as we journey this pathway of life. We pray, Lord, that you continue to speak to our hearts, to guide us, Lord, and to help us just to be a body of people, Lord, that you would be pleased and satisfied with. We pray for this service now, Lord, that everything would be well-pleasing to you. And in it all, may you be glorified. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a God celestial shore. Shadow of this life is gone. I'll fly away like a bird from prison bars is flown. Be a hallelujah, mean women step on the other side. Saints of old standing in a green to welcome us across the tide. We'll lift glad hands together, go shouting on through the land. And when you think it's just about in it, it'll happen all over again. Oh, what a celebration, forgetting where we've been. We're standing on the top of Zion, triumphant over sin. First the angels will stop singing, then the joy bells start to ring. And prepare you all of heaven when the saints go marching in. Oh, won't that be a hallelujah me? Step on the other side. Saints of old standing in the green to welcome us across the tide. We'll lift glad hands together, go shouting all through the land. And when you think it's just about it, it'll happen all over again. Well, I've been laughed at here for shouting. Since many long years ago, I got more than just religion. When Jesus saved my soul, I got a way down deep salvation, like no mortal tongue can tell. And a standing invitation to a hallelujah spell. Oh, won't 
at the Hallelujah Meek, step on the other side. Saints of old standing in the green, welcome us across the tide. We'll lift glad hands together, go shouting all through the land. And when you think it's just about it, it'll happen all over again. And everybody will be happy, will be happy over that. We will shout and sing God's praise. Everybody will be happy over that. Oh, everybody will be happy, will be happy over that. We will shout and sing God's praise. Everybody will be happy over that. Oh, everybody. We'll be happy, we'll be happy over that. We will shout and sing God's praise. Everybody will be happy over that. Oh, everybody will be happy, we'll be happy over that. We will shout and Sing God's praise. Everybody will be happy over there. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You've been so good. You've been so good to me. You've been a doctor. Been a lawyer. Been a heart fixer and a mind regulator. Made a way. Healed the sick, the lame to walk. Even made the dumb to talk, oh yes, I thank you, Lord, I thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, you've been so good, you've been so good to me, been a doctor, been a lawyer, been a heart fixer and a mind regulator, made a way, healed the sick, the lame to walk. Even made the dumb to talk, oh yes, I thank you, Lord, I thank you, Lord, I thank you, Lord, you've been so good, you've been so good to me, you've been a doctor, you've been a lawyer, you've been a heart fixer and a mind regulator, made, made a way, healed the sick, the lame to walk. Even made the dumb to talk, oh yes, I thank you, Lord, I thank you, Lord, I thank you, Lord, you've been so good, you've been so good to me, been a doctor, been a lawyer, been a heart fixer and a mind regulator, made a way, healed the sick, lame to walk. Even made the dumb to talk, oh yes, I thank you, Lord. Amen. He is the only reason I live, but oh, what a reason. He's the only reason I live, but oh, what a reason. There's nothing in this world worth living for. It only leaves you empty and longing for more. Oh, what a reason Is the only reason I live Oh, what a reason He's the only reason I live But oh There's nothing in this world worth living for. It only leaves you empty and 
longing for more. Oh, he's the only reason I live. But oh, what a reason. Amen. I'm sorry. Nothing can hold me here. I'm headed home. Heavenly gates are near, and it won't be long till I'll be walking on streets of gold, singing around God's throne. Nothing can hold me here. I'm headed home. Nothing can hold me here. I'm headed home. Heavenly gates are near. And it won't be long till I'll be walking on streets of gold Singing around God's throne Nothing can hold me here I'm headed home If I should die before that trumpet sound And they lay my body in the cold, cold ground You don't have to weep for me Don't sing me no sad song Nothing can hold me here. I'm headed home. Nothing can hold me here. I'm headed home. Heavenly gates are near, and it won't be long till I'll be walking on streets of gold, singing around God's throne. Nothing can hold me here. I'm headed home. and Sister James, y'all get ready next. This is a real old song, so all you young people that are over 40 should know it. <laughs> so you help me out. You ask me why I'm thankful, why I sometimes sing and shout. The Lord put something in my heart that I can shout about. I'm thankful cause he heard my prayer and he answered me one day I'm thankful cause he saved my soul in the old time fashioned way You ask me why I'm thankful, why I sometimes sing and shout You ask me why I'm thankful when the whole world's full of doubt You ask me what it is I have that makes me feel this way I found it in the Word of God when I knelt down to pray. Well, this is why I'm thankful, why I sometimes sing and shout. The Lord put something in my heart that I can shout about. I'm thankful because He heard my prayer and answered me one day. I'm thankful because He saved my soul in the old-time-fashioned way. They 
told me about a man who walked the shores of Galilee, who had the power to open eyes of those who could not see. He had the power to heal the lame and make the dumb to talk. He also said unto the man, take up thy bed and walk. Oh, this is why I'm thankful, why I sometimes sing and shout. The Lord put something in my heart that I can shout about. I'm thankful because He heard my prayer and He answered me one day. I'm thankful because He saved my soul in the old time fashioned way. He promised me a mansion, oh, I love Him more and more. Sometime I know I'll walk with Him upon that golden shore. He's always near and dear to me, and He helps me in my strife. Someday I know I'll dwell with Him, cause I have eternal life. Well, this is why I'm thankful, why I sometimes sing and shout. The Lord put something in my heart that I can shout about. I'm thankful because He heard my prayer and He answered me one day. I'm thankful because He saved my soul in the old time fashioned way. Amen. Yep. Amen. I think I know that. <laughs> Amen. All right, y'all come right on. This has been requested by a precious sister, so we're going to give it a try. It's an old one. Bigger than all the shadows that fall across my path, God is bigger than any mountain that I can or cannot see.
I'd like to thank the Lord that I've been coming here, I believe it's going to be 27 years this fall. And I was praying, Lord, I want to be in your bride and I want to know truth. And I saw before me the praying hands. And I came and the first thing I saw on the back of the contender was the praying hands. And I just knew that this was the place for me. And I thank him for the truth that he's shown me. And I hope through these 27 years that I've learned a lot. I hope that I'll be able to stand and stand for, for truth. And uh, I just appreciate the Lord for what he's done for me in my life. Tim. <laughs> Paul and Naomi, I'll get next. I just want to thank the Lord. Um, he's been dealing with me, little things, and then I told him, <laughs> told him I was, you know, determined that I'm gonna. There's little things, you know, we all need to fix, and I, there's little things I'm trying to fix in my life, and I told him I'm, this, you know, I'm gonna do it, and and now, you know, of course the devil, he, he hears you when you tell the God that, so he. But he come after me this week a few times. But I'm I'm following my God. He's so wonderful. I just love him and praise him because I know I must have said something that just aggravated the devil. So I must have said something right if it aggravated him. So I'm just gonna keep on following the Lord, and I want him to keep working on me and making me better. And maybe I'll be perfect or however it works. <laughs> but I just wanna try to be better every day and I just I just love him and thank him I'm here in this battle Lord wounded soldier am I Enemies raging around me, and he's crowding my mind. So, Lord, I'm calling out to you, for you know what I need, and while I'm facing this battle. Oh, Lord, Lord, send a refuge for me. Lord, send me a refuge to hide from the storm. Wrap me in your sweet love. Keep me safe. Need a message from you, Lord, to know you're still here with me. So, Lord, I'm trying with all my strength not to.
to drown in this sea So while I'm facing this task Lord, all that I ask Please send a refuge for me Lord, send me a refuge To hide from the storm Wrap me in your sweet love Keep me safe from all need a message from you, Lord, to know you're still here with me. So, Lord, I'm trying with all my strength not to drown in this sea. So, while I'm facing this task, all that I ask, we send a refuge for me. Lord, send me a refuge to hide from the storm. Wrap me Keep me safe from all harm. When the trials of this old world send me down on my knees, won't you hear my prayer? Oh Lord, send a refuge for Won't you hear my prayer, oh Lord, send a refuge for me. Amen. All right, y'all, come on. Kevin, Sandy, y'all get ready. I like to say, uh, you know, they say a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And a lot of us feel like we're the least among us. I know that's true, but each one of us is an example of the, the whole body to those around about us we work with and associate with each day, and it's up to each one of us to be that example that we need to be and spend time in prayer and reading. I'm speaking to myself too. Lord knows what each one of us has need of and where we lack in our lives and he'll give us anything we desire if we'll just commit the time to him F. what would i do without jesus 
the shepherd of my valley Lord I just couldn't walk this road alone when I'm hungry he feeds me when I'm thirsty he's my water I couldn't make it without Jesus what would I do when I need someone to talk to? He's always there to listen with his arms fold about me. He rocks me in his bosom. What would I do? Shepherd of my valley, I couldn't make it without Jesus. What would I do when my tears flow like a river and my burdens are high as a mountain? And when the ones that I've counted on have let me down That's when I turn to Jesus He's the one that I can count on I couldn't make it without Jesus What would I do? I need someone to talk to He's always there to listen When his arms fold about me He rocks me in his bosom What would I do without Jesus The shepherd of my valley to talk to He's always there to listen When His arms fold about me He rocks me in His bosom What would I do without Jesus The shepherd of my valley I couldn't make it Without Jesus, what would I do?
as they rolled apart. I've rested in peace as he spoke to my trembling heart. I Appreciate you being here and let us stand at this time if we would. I'm going to ask Brother Black back there to lead us in prayer if he would. Brother. Yes. Yes, Lord. Grant it, Lord. Bless him. Help us, Lord, that we will receive everything that he has for us, Lord. Yes. Bless us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yes, Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Turn the service over to Brother Jackson. Thank you, Brother Allen. You may be seated tonight. Once again, I want to greet you, my brothers and sisters. 
And we're continuing on the message that we was on this morning. Unity and what is it? How do we look at unity? Well, the dictionary plainly states it's to unite, to come together in a common cause. And as we've got Isaiah 52, 8 up here, I read it from the Hebrew setting this morning. And we have seen in the last three years what's going on in the Middle East. Somewhere in front of us, we're approaching the hour when God is going to absolutely restore Zion. There was a, a Route 7 news this week. Already, certain officials in Israel have said to the Jews, we're going to again allow the Jews to go back to the Temple Mount area. Well, that's one of the things that helped to start this thing in the last two years. Ariel Sharon went up on this, the mount, and you know the Muslims just went haywire. So the police have sort of put it on a restricted basis. But now then, they begin to realize, we'll say the two and a half years that the Jewish people have been held away from their sacred biblical spot. Now then, the authorities of Israel are saying, they're soon going to get ready to allow the Jews to come back to the temple spot. You know exactly what that's going to start. This road map to peace is not going to carry out. This is just a lull before the storm. And the Hebrew settings this morning closed out. When the watchmen, who are these watchmen to? It's the church watchmen. When together they see a common vision. And it identifies you and tells you when it's going to be. When Yahweh rebuilds Zion. Young and old. We don't have a lifetime to play around. That's in front of us. We don't know the day, the month, or the hour. But in front of us somewhere it's going to be. And I'm convinced that when it starts, God is going to be well on his way of uniting us. And right now when we talk about it, I know sometimes for the young mind that's never lived in any other era than in, say, in the past 20 years, it's hard for them to realize just how this could be. But I will say, when all of a sudden you see that Middle East, it just looks like it suddenly exploded overnight in its own fire. With God using that Israeli army, God's going to make fools out of all this Western power and technology. You and I are going to see developments in the world's political and military settings that's going to begin to make us realize we are not far away from that era of time. That should tell me, Raymond Jackson, you don't have a lifetime, you don't even have 10 more years to get yourself ready for the coming of Jesus. And if I have any part to do with this thing of uniting God's people, I want to do it with all my heart. Now to the people, I say this tonight. No, you'll never be in unity until you see men standing shoulder to shoulder in the same vision. As long as you feel that somebody else could have something other that you ain't got, curiosity is going to lead you there. And you're going to go. And you're going to invest your time and your prayers and your enthusiasm to go and see what it's all about. Just to, I don't want to miss anything. I promise you, if you get your feet established on truth, you ain't going to miss a thing. 
But if for some reason in your heart you don't know really what is and what ain't, and you're just running here and there speculating, hope I do find it somewhere, run into it by accident, by accident, then you'll never know it when you see it face to face. It's just like a lot of remarks some people wouldn't know if it was a blue ribbon tied on a boxcar. Because they don't have a spirit of revelation inside of them to tell them that's right. When I go back 50 some years, and when I went to hear that little man that I speak so much about, I didn't have to hear him say much that I knew exactly that man's got something I want. And I'm not going to let daylight come between him and, and me. I had went to A.A. Allen's. I have seen Oral Roberts. I have been Gary Hart's, the Jessup brothers. You name them, I have seen them all. But that little man had something other that made the Bible live to me. And I am thankful tonight it was by God's grace. He gave me the ability to sit there many times and listen. I did not see a God, but he made the God of the Bible, Jesus Christ, stand head and shoulders taller than any other preacher I'd ever heard. Now I want to say these to, this tonight. I'm going to turn to the King James Version and read what it says about Isaiah 52.8. Thy watchman, that's the ministry to the church. As I said this morning, the seventh verse was a prophecy foretold. And by the way, brothers and sisters, as Paul referred to this in Romans chapter 10, you will also find that same thing in the prophet Nahum chapter 1 verse 15. And when that prophecy started... God started calling out of the world a people to get ready for his church because he's done cut the Jews off. And I want to say tonight, if we can but just recognize the grace of God, it could very well be, brothers and sisters, when preachers begin to get the same vision and they begin to stand on the same platform of truth, we could be just a short distance away in time from what God's going to do for the Jewish people. It will let me know we don't have time to play around and speculate. Them watch when I cannot be nothing else than Ephesians 4. Verses 11, 12, 13, and 14. You do not hear that from the church world. That was all for the days of the apostles. But remember, brothers and sisters, Jesus likened to the kingdom of heaven to a grain of corn planted into the ground. Well, he was you illustrating the early church. Whatever you think it was, whatever it looked like, it means what is harvested at the end of time, he will harvest another church looks exactly like it. You don't plant corn and reap rice. You don't plant rice and reach, reap grass seed. Each one's got the, the germination law within itself. Now I realize tonight, brothers and sisters, and I say this with all humility the best I know how. My life has been recognized by a lot of people through the years as being that an apostle. When you read the epistles of Paul, I, had a, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, called of God. Paul wrote no less than about 16 epistles, and they all have that same introduction. But you've never heard me get up here and say, I, Raymond Jackson, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the day, brothers and sisters, that God is pulling people out of this religious, confused mess. And he's going to leave it up to you to recognize what is and what ain't. And if you don't recognize something somewhere, somewhere you might get off track. 
looking for something other than you was looking right in the face. And the Spirit of God is going to quicken certain things to certain people enough. They're going to know beyond the shadow of a doubt. That's what I've been looking for. Guys, I look back a few months when I started dealing with this situation. Some people took offense. Even some of you in here did. You show it on your face. Sometimes your accent speaks louder than your words. That hurts me to think that you've sat here for these number of years. And you've never saw a thing. I never asked you to come. You're not bound to sit here. But I know, brothers and sisters, we're moving toward a period of time. The day will come when everybody that sits in those pews is going to be looking at the same thing. East Chicago, Bloomington, Manitoba, Norway, or Canada, wherever these people are, they're going to be looking at the same thing and agreeing one with another. You don't glorify a flash, but you have to glorify God. He's not coming down here in flash to talk to you and prove what His Word says. You're either going to recognize it by the Holy Spirit or something's going to pass you right on by. I say these things with respect, but I'm not afraid of what I'm saying. I'm not ashamed. Like I've said many times, and Brother Sosito, he kind of cackles and laughs about it. You don't tie my shoes and you don't butter my bread. When you get tired of listening to what I have to say, then you can go somewhere else. But for God's sake, don't use faith assembly like a stray chicken. Well, Brother Jackson, you shouldn't talk like that. If Jesus was to walk in our midst, there's some of us he might scold. And he might say some things that make us feel bunny little. And I don't never want him to have to point the finger to me and say, my servant, you have failed me. You did not lift up my word and me in it the way you should have. I can't compel people to believe in me. But by the grace of God, for 50-some years, I've done my best to live a Christian life. You've never seen me judging people how high I leap. Or because I speak in tongues or anything. That's not the primary thing in the first place. It's got to be the truth that I present and the life I live. I'm not here to deceive you or nor mislead you. But when I leave the platform, I don't intend to bow my head and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do this. I didn't mean to do that. When you start acting that way, brothers and sisters, the devil can use that. No apostle ever talked like that. Neither did any of the early ministry. I will read this eighth verse. Thy watchman, and I put myself right in there, along with any other preacher that I know and have been acquainted with through the years gone by. I'm not your captain in that sense. I don't wear bars, bars and stripes or nothing. It's only the calling that God has put in my life and the revelation of the truth he's put in my soul shall lift up the voice with the voice together the evangelist will say amen the pastor will say amen the teacher will say hallelujah amen and the prophet will do the same I'm with you praise the Lord and however many apostles they are they're going to say all say amen let's go get them Well, now we've got to be careful here, Brother Jackson. You know, 
There's a lot of mistakes being made, and we're all human. You go back to the denominations where you come from with that attitude. When God put a hunger in my heart for truth, I searched and I went and I looked. I couldn't find it where nowhere. So when I left them, I left them set there. I didn't pay them another visit. And on that February morning in 1952, when God opened that book of Luke, the first chapter, and showed me there, I had never heard about Brother Branham before. Yet born right here within 19 miles of Jeffersonville. <clears throat> and what I read that and I seen that John the Baptist was that spirit of Elijah for the first advent of his coming. And when that angel told Zacharias that his wife was going to be the mother of that child, and I seen how the angel had faith, did not did not quote the last part of Malachi 4. I didn't hear an audible voice, but it was a revelation that hit my soul. Then if that was true for this day, for that day, he'll send that spirit of Elijah again in this end time, just before the coming of Christ, to finish Malachi 4, 5, and 6 in entirety. Then in August 1952 was when Brother Glenn came out of the woods squirrel hunting. And after a while he began to tell me about Brother Bannon being in Africa. All the miracles was taking place. And that he was going to start a, a week's meeting that coming week. When he told me about what said was said down at the Ohio River, Something inside of me says, if those words are true, then that's the spirit of Elijah that is to come again. I want to see him. And my first time to see that little man come out and preach. When I left that church that night, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, if I never heard him preach another sermon, that's the man. All hell ain't going to stop me from listening to what that man has to say. Little did I realize that the next day he was going to be on my home place hunting squirrels. And from then on, brothers and sisters, through the years and months, different times I had my privilege and opportunity to have him there rabbit hunting or squirrel hunting. I didn't ask God for favors, but he let me see this man. I walked through the brush rabbit hunting. I've eaten his own house. He's eaten in my house. Does that make me anything? Not at all. But it did make me a witness that I saw something and God helped me that I perceive it in the right aspect. And little did I realize, brothers and sisters, that one day this little old Harrison County farmer only have an eighth grade one day I would bear witness of him around this world. And when God took that little man off of this earthly scene, it's a shame the men that went here and there ever worth preaching this. They had so many revelations, brothers and sisters, running out their mouth. And thousands of people are following him tonight. Sitting in the middle of the road, drying up, wheeling away, just like last year's corn shucks. And some places are saying the rapture's passed. Then they're still here. Well, I know it hasn't passed. And I realize sometimes, brother and sister, I say the things very harsh. I'm not trying to say harsh things to you. You're my brothers and sisters. But I want that dirty devil to know I'm not ashamed of what I'm saying. I remember when we come into the 70s. We've done started printing a contender in 69. But all of a sudden, I get a tract sent to me. Branhamism, fact or fiction. I read that and I looked at it. They condemned him because he was supposed to be Elijah. 
They condemned him because he preached serpent seed. They condemned him because he preached predestination. Now I thought, for goodness sake, ain't some of these preachers of the mess going to open up their mouths and say something? Not a one. Claudine can tell you. I prayed, Lord, give me something to say to that bunch of hypocrites. And I put together a letter. Claudine over there. She typed it up. And then we printed it. It was my rebuttal. And the title of their tract was Branhamism, Fact or Fiction. And I have to say, where was Perry Green at? Where was Dr. Lee Bale at? Where were they? Hiding in the bushes. I challenged them on the Malachi. I challenged them on serpent seed and predestination. Greg Paisley's father was sitting here then at that coming convention. And I spoke concerning it. And he took the same letter, he took it back to Canada. The Jesus name man in Canada that worked with a man out in Missouri at Oneness headquarters where the original track was printed and published. We sent it to the headquarters and Brother Paisley took it up there in Canada and gave it to this man. And all the man would say, well, a lot of these things were said and printed before he had a chance to look it over. Brothers and sisters, I have not tried to be smart. But already in a certain type of a magazine that's published today, you can probably get them in libraries, cults. And the Branham name movement is in it. I don't know whether they got faith assembly or not. It doesn't matter to me. In the way they call heresy, that's exactly the way I'm going to worship and serve my Lord. It was Paul who said that. And tonight I'm not ashamed for what I, by the grace of God, has done through 30-some years since Brother Branham's death. I will defend his name, his reputation, his ministry, and the truth he brought. And there's no doctrine of divinity that I have to bow my head to. Most all of them, brothers and sisters, are bygone days. And they spend millions of dollars to deceive people and mislead people. And I have to say tonight, over this world, since 1969, when we left this country and went to Canada our first time, there are little groups of people tonight that believe exactly what we have printed and stood for. I thank God. It's not a lie. I have never said I know everything. But what I do know, I have no intention to change in my attitude. Because to me, it's the Word of God. No, you're not going to get the Methodists and the Baptists to agree with it. It was never written for their sake anyhow. When Brother Branham was used by God to open the six seals. Do you hear any TV preachers preaching about them? No. It's closed to them. They don't know more, more about seals than my dog knows about making lollipops. That's exactly just about how blind the world, religious world is. They don't even know where they're at. And I'm thankful to God tonight. Now I'll never forget. <clears throat> Back in them 60s, just before Brother Branham was taken off of the scene, God knew the church order was going to be made. Now I'm saying this tonight, brothers and sisters, to say this to some people that in Bloomington might eventually hear this. Some of you up there are making so much noise like nobody else can hear what you're saying. 
We can hear you plumb down here. You say you're anointed to prophesy. Be careful, Brother Jackson. I'm more careful than you are. Because I have had 50 years of looking and analyzing stuff like this. But you listen to what I have to say. To the little bride of Christ, young ones, up the road in front of you, when this little bride gets to be brought together and we can sit together agreeing and seeing the same thing and rejoicing in the Lord about the same thing and we can look overseas and see Israel beginning to bloom. There's something in the atmosphere that's going to begin to make us feel like it's just about over. There's no world revival going to become about by you prophesying. Forget it. You may think it will, but it will not. Because the scripture don't say that. Because Ephesians 4, he sent certain types of ministries to accomplish this. And it will be done by the, how they handle the word of God, not emotions or certain gifts. And some of you in Bloomington might say, well, that's Brother Jackson. Why we don't like to come down to you? You scare us. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm only trying to say this to wake up your mind, to let you know I've been a long time here before you even got here. Just before the church order was made, I went into my bedroom one night to pray. When I was through praying, I just, I stayed there and meditated. And directly something just came over me and I opened my mouth. And these words just come out so even. Yea, I say unto thee, my son, I speak unto you by my spirit. But I shall be with thee to guide thee. And to protect thee in all the ways wherein that I would have thee to walk. I will be with thee when thou art looked down upon by men and rejected up by many. And I have seen them come and go. And that's exactly what's happened. Amen. The minute that church order was made and the minute they heard that Jackson wouldn't put it in, they hung me to the high heavens. And I have to say tonight, thank God he gave me grace enough to resist it. But I want you to know, brothers and sisters, for better than a year and a half, I've told it before, but I'll have to say it again tonight. I lived in an atmosphere of eternal fear in myself. Because every time we I turn, it's just like the devil said, be careful what you say. That was the prophet said that. That's thus saith the Lord. Church order. How many times I've searched this Bible could I find church order? I could find it nowhere. But the more I searched, the worse I felt. Because I was losing all the old friends that I used to meet at the tabernacle. I could see every time I would get around, yes, they avoid me. I never wanted to offend people. I wanted to love people. Then, brothers and sisters, I was asked to come to Missouri in a meeting. We knew these people, nice, lovely people, nice little congregation. We went out there. We stayed with the, the man in charge of the church. Nice people. Treated us good. But we no sooner get there, all they're talking about, church order, church order, church order. For days, that's all I could hear, church order, church order. And I told you about 
One day they wanted to go into town and eat dinner in there. Well, I felt good when I got in the car. By the time we drove about eight miles into the little town to get out of the car to go to a restaurant, I get out of the car, and just like everything, went dizzy. I grabbed the side of the car and held on. I couldn't understand what in the world has happened to me. As I looked across the street to where the restaurant was at, here I'm holding on to the car, and it's just like everything is going around with me. I didn't feel like I was sick at my stomach, but yet everything inside my head was just going in a circle. They started walking across the street. Craig, the wife said, honey, come on. I managed to let loose of the car and I got a hold of her arm and we got into the restaurant and sat down. I sat there and looked at the menu and I said, well, honey, you just go ahead and order something for us. Slowly, after a while, the dizziness just began to lift. I ate my dinner and went back to their house that, night, uh, that evening. I went to bed and took a nap. And I'm saying these things, brothers and sisters, to let you know the devil sure has a way of really tormenting you. And when I look back, brothers and sisters, I can see how God was letting me be tried because he knew up the road I will have to stand for something. I want every person that hears these words that I'm saying, I stand here to tell you the truth. I managed to get to that meeting and come home, and I said, I'm going to go to the doctor. Dr. Brockman of Corden was our doctor at the time. So we went down there. He took my blood pressure. He listened at my heart. He said, well, Raymond, I can't find a thing wrong. And then he says, have you been under a lot of tension? <laughs> no. <laughs> Brother Adam, tension can sure play havoc with you. Well, he says, I'm going to give you a little medicine. You just take this when you get home. A little old pill. I didn't know what it was. But I went home. I took a few of them. I never did fail to have that dizziness no more. But I fought that battle. All until February 1965, when Brother Branham preached. The message is up in the high school building. How many men? How many in here that remember that? In my mind was that constant warfare, church order, church order. And when we got there, everywhere I looked, there he is, there he is. I tried my best to avoid any kind of controversy, but I sat through their meetings. And Brother Billy, the night that Brother Branham was on the platform, and he said, behind me, on a certain place, there's a man got a daughter and described her. You remember Billy? I was sitting just across the opposite, on the opposite side of the aisle. And my mind was still church order. But just as sure as I'm standing here tonight, I see these things in defense of the faith that God brought me through. All of a sudden, it was just like I felt a great big band around my chest. And I could only inhale so much. And the word said, How long will you doubt my word? It was a question. Because I had studied. Church order is not in here. How long will you doubt my word? I said, Lord, I can't doubt it no longer. It's not in your book. Just like a great big pair of scissors come right up my back and snap that. And there was a release. 
And from that day to this, I thank God. He knows how to come to your rescue. But it was an experience. I had to go through it for other people's sake. To know that when the time has come, when you stand for something, you will stand knowing you've stood for this. Not for human flesh. And I'm thankful tonight, brothers and sisters, the way God has allowed me to, to see some of these things. When we come on around, and then the Lord began to open the doors. I remember, brothers and sisters, there was one particular message I used to be, start preaching on when I'd go to some of these other places. And one of them is the mystery of the coming of Elijah. I would take Malachi 4 and use it as a text. But I said, remember this. This goes on in our diplomatic world today. Anytime a world leader, especially in olden times when it was royalty, kings or princesses from a government that's going to visit another country, that government always sends an envoy first. I'm sure you've read about it. And I said, it's a fact. God had to send Elijah again. He is God's envoy to announce that the Lord is coming soon. And I looked back, and everywhere I went, I preached that. I had denominational people in some of these places. They'd walk up and shake my hand and said, Thank you, Brother Jackson. You have made that so plain. It's understandable. Then I'll never forget in 1969, when the invitation was made for us to come to Canada. I preached it the first thing. Then the next message I started preaching was serpent seed. God had given me the revelation of what really took place in the Garden of Eden. We was in a big senior citizens building in Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada. And the place had a lot of people in it. I'll never forget one, pre one precious sister. She was sitting there, and I, it, it looked like she was gritting her teeth. And she told me later, when I heard you saying what you did about what Eve did, she said, I couldn't help but ask myself, my God, what have I gotten myself into? But you know, when I finished that message, and by the time I get them back there again, she said, Brother Jackson, that is so simple and plain. Remember, brothers and sisters, in 1968 then, when I had the dream of going to the mailbox and bringing this nice envelope, I could tell by the looks of the envelope, the style it was, it was not just an ordinary cheap envelope. It held some kind of an official document. When I brought it in the house and opened it, there it was, minister's license. I've never carried minister's license in my life. But here it was, in beautiful type, that fancy writing. But right above it was the word apostle. Dated August the 1st. 1965, that was the day that I told him the dream. And as, as I read down through there, be it known unto you, that Raymond Jackson hereby is authorized and I begin to put scriptures to preach such, 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 such. That day he told me the horse was the power of the word, but he never told me what the work was. 
But when I read that, here it told me what it all was. Signed, William, William Marion Branham. August the 1st was when I told him the dream. But here it was two years and a half later. Let her hear about it. And I will say this tonight. I have never used it to brag. I have left it up to God to vindicate it with and however he wants to. I have had people from all over the world to write me. Brother Jackson, we can see by your ministry what your calling is. Now that brings me to the point I want to honor a young sister up in Canada. When I began to deal with this situation that had developed, I did not know what the reaction among all the people was going to be. From the local, yes, there was some repercussions. But there's a young sister, she's been here. But when I first went into Canada, she was only about 13 years of age. So at that time, she said, I was too young to really give much attention to what she was preaching. But I had touched this my first time, then she wrote this nice letter. And she begins to introduce time when she was young and the things that transpired from her own home, how her daddy, being a preacher, had withstood me on the 70 weeks of Daniel. I remember he wrote me a letter. He said, Brother Jackson, he says, I went on a long fast. And God has showed me that you're wrong on the 70 weeks of Daniel. I never replied. Because I knew sooner or later, God would vindicate it. Went all through the years. And the man wound up doing some things he shouldn't have ever done. Later I understand, he come to the realization, I was right. And he was wrong, but he never did say, I'm sorry. I don't say anything to be critical. But that young sister said, Brother Jackson, one day God began to put a hunger in my heart to get some of these things all straightened out. And in that letter she states how that she went into her bedroom one day and she took her Bible. And God calls her to read the various scriptures. And in that letter she said, Brother Jackson, I know you're an apostle. Because God has revealed it to me out of the scriptures. I never asked for that. But she stood in defense of what I was doing back a few months ago. I don't say these things to be abusive to anybody. I'll say this tonight, if my brother Tim hears this, Brother Tim, I want you to know, I'm looking right at you, and the days are coming. You're not an apostle, neither are you a prophet, but if you are an evangelist, and you're one of God's true evangelists, you're going to be finding yourself with some other men. Because you're going to want to get your ministry tied in with them. It doesn't make a bit of difference how many of these young people are going hog wild and pig crazy after you. Because if you get down the road some of these days, a hollering and a shopping and a shouting, and you look all around you and you've only got a splinter of people following you, then when you begin to look at the surroundings, you may not find no apostle. You may not find no prophet. What are you going to do? I have to say this. I say this with all due respect. When I started dealing with this situation from Colorado, from Alabama, from different places, dreams, people begin to send in to me. I never asked for them. It was the way God was bearing witness to hearts of people. Here's one I never told nobody. 
This came from a sister down in Alabama. She'll know when she hears this. It was a nice letter sent by email. Brother Jackson, I saw myself like I was approaching some kind of an arena, like a gymnasium. You was dressed like one of these sword pincers. And after a while, here came another man. And two of you went on the floor. You were both dressed to spar. How many knows what a sword pincer is? He said you sparred all over the place. But none of you was hurt. She said, I watched that. And I knew that somewhere it had to have a deep meaning. That was not a carnal sword. That's this word. God knew what was coming down the road. It was just his way of sharpening me up. Because I have to go on record. And God can bear witness to me. I'll defend this in the face of any preacher. Don't step across it. How many understand what I mean? I don't care how many prophecies you have gotten. <clears throat> As I told a brother this morning, I have seen those things, they come and they go. But usually when they go, they leave a bunch of people all confused or so shut up, you never hear them say another word. Because they're done out of season and out of respect to the whole body of Christ. It's just a, it's a click. They get all excited and they get carried away. And they, they lose sight of who they are and really what they are. I've seen my share of people. And at one time, brothers and sisters, when I was young, I could have been caught up with them if it had not been for the grace of God. Let me begin to see foolishness. And I said to a brother, there'll be a true prophecy come through here and there. But when you put it all together, it has not put a perfect picture together of unity or how the church should live or conduct itself. How many, how many knows what I'm saying tonight? When Brother Branham was on the scene, he was an angelic messenger. He's Revelation 10, 7. The seventh church age angel messenger. There's an angelic being behind him somewhere. Every preacher that is sent forth, somewhere behind him, there is an angelic being directing his pathway. He does not walk on his own. He has been inspired by something. As I speak this thing tonight, brothers and sisters, up the road in front of us, there's going to be unity in the entire body of Christ around this world. We're all going to stand for the same thing. And I'll tell you, there's going to be exactly the gifts that God wants it to be. And there ain't nobody going to be a standing up, a yelling and a screaming and a jumping all over the place, prophesying to everything When you do that, sooner or later you'll get out of season. And when you've gone far enough, if you don't wake up and realize how, how far you have gone, then God will pull the plug. And you'll sit down. I say these things tonight. A few years ago in Canada, there was a great big charismatic meeting. They called it the Toronto Blessing. At home in a big storage box. I've got sheets and sheets and sheets of, sheets of that stuff. The experiences, how it affected the people. It's just God's way of sending angels to sift out and separate the foolish virgins. If you understand what I mean. They didn't think that. Oh, it was like heaven to them, and it, to them it was. 
But when it was done, they did not have no more scripture to stand on than nothing. Down in Florida, it was the same way. In Alabama, there was another place. All of that sprung up in the ranks of the foolish virgins. And there's angelic beings in it, separating. Then we come on right down the line. And this seventh church age messenger, brothers and sisters, he brings a simple message back to the Word of God. And look at these preachers. Here's one going this way, another going that way. There's no more unity and consistency in what he was supposed to have said than a man on the moon. So I have to say, behind every man, there was a spirit. The man himself is not on his own. He's inspired by something other in the spirit world. How many understand my point? Amen. And brothers and sisters, for 30 some years, by the grace of God, I've done my best to stand here for a truth that I know that God has put in my heart. We have printed it. You've read it. It stood the test. I've never asked for glory. I've only said, God, use it. And it's been born witness to. And I will say tonight, God's going to take that truth and make a foundation. And he's going to start uniting some people with the ministry of real true men that have a true vision. No, the evangelist doesn't have to ask the pastor, now what am I supposed to preach? He's supposed to preach what God wants him to preach. But he's going to get his nose in this book. Matthew 13, 41, 42. Turn to it if you want to. That's talking about the harvest at the end of time. In that day the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, plural, not one, not two, but as many as necessary. And they will separate out of his kingdom all things that offend. That's anybody that teaches something other and goes contrary to the word of God. And them that do iniquity. Oh, that's just a little word, ain't it? Preacher, be careful. Them that do iniquity. You know what that word means in the religious sense? Isaiah talks about it. O Lucifer, Isaiah 14, Saturday of the morning, how thou hast fallen from heaven. How thou hast said in thy heart, I want to go up and set myself on the sides of the throne of God. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. The prophet Ezekiel picks it up in the 28th chapter. He looked and he seen Lucifer. Oh, thou most anointed cherub. Thou hast been in the garden of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. And the last of it closes up by saying, Thou wast perfect. Perfect until iniquity was found in thee. The word iniquity means to rebel against divine authority. Step over. Go on, make fun of it. Pay no attention to that, Jackson. He's an old man now. How do we know that his mind is operating right? I have to say, brothers and sisters, when my mind gets to the place where God can't use it, God put me in a box. Get me out of this stinking world. And I have to say, brothers and sisters, when you watch a lot of these preachers, they've gone over the country, and I'm talking about Benny Hinn and all that other kind. 
I've seen some of them tent meetings that he's been in, brothers and sisters, and my, the people by the... And I will say, yes, God heals here and there. He's obligated to the promise. But the man himself, he's guilty of not preaching a whole standard of God's word, and you know it. I seen him in one meeting on a TV program. Here he stands, and here this vast auditorium, the bleachers was full. And just to show you how silly and crazy some people are. And he looks up to the bleachers. And he just goes, And brothers and sisters, it was just like a, a hurricane come through. They're slaying there in the bleachers by the dozens. We got people in this religious world today, that's all they live for. I have nothing against the real power of God when it slays a person. But I've got a lot against this thing. Some people, they have to lay on the floor 90% of the time. Or they feel like they ain't got nothing. Back in 94, when the move of the Spirit started among us, and I'm saying this, and I'm going to let you to go home on it. I had that dream in June of 1993. But the Holy Spirit moving did not start until 94. And I'll never forget when it began to manifest itself here in Faith Assembly. I seen them come from Bloomington. They some from here went to Georgia when Brother Bud went down there. Not one time have you heard me open my big mouth and scold people. Why ain't you doing something? Why don't you get up and shout and run? You never heard me say anything, did you? And you got to listen to me out there. You want to write me an email? Tell me about it. I knew it was God fulfilling a purpose among his people. And I didn't care who he used. He didn't have to have my hands. He let me see it as an experience. But I'm thankful that I got to see it fulfilling itself. I kept my mouth shut. That's a sad part. Some preachers can't keep it shut. And I've seen some of them in my lifetime. They got to be in the thick of it. Well, I didn't have to be in the thick of it. Because that first convention when it began to make its appearance. And the videos was made of it. I didn't go to Africa. But they took the videos Brother Govender did. And the minute he showed it the first time, it started. That let me know it was a sovereignty of God that was on the move. I've seen young people here go down to Georgia when Bud would be down there. Come back reeling in a rock and just... They were literally drunk. And it's not because they had drinking any wine either. They never came back popping off. And I say to every one of you that did go down there and know what I'm talking about, God bless your little hearts. Whatever you receive, somewhere's one of these days, if you can keep your mentality right, and keep your feet on the ground and in the truth. Then's when you're going to really see the Spirit of God in the bride. Start functioning everything. Because you will see things in the world that will necess necessitate all of it. But every one of these individuals that want to make a show of something. They want to run ahead. Young people in Bloomington, please... I'm not trying to belittle you. God bless your heart. But I'll say this long before it ever happens. You're not going to create a revival at all. You're going to wind up the road some of these days, woke up and realizing something played a trick on you. And the sad part of it is you're jumping right over the very foundation. Nowhere in the scriptures does he create revivals by just prophecy. 
And I'll have to say, if some of these preachers are angels, then the time will come, they will not listen to nothing. They'll not listen to me. I'm wrong. And some of you people in Kentucky and Virginia, you've been here so many times through the years to our conventions. I love you. I appreciate you. But if you don't know what I'm looking at, then God help you. You're in a good shape for the devil to play a trick on you. And the day will come, you will say bye-bye, babe, to me. I'm saying these things tonight. Bloomington, Manitoba, East Chicago, wherever you may be, I stand on this book. I want to be a friend to everybody. But I don't owe nobody an apology. I know what I'm doing. And I pray to God that you do too. My platform is going to be a platform for the real ministers to the bride of Christ. I'm not saying these things to be offensive. But I'm saying these things. I've spoke the truth. I'm not ashamed. And I don't owe you a thing. You may not see what I'm looking at, but I do. And when that move of the Spirit started back in 94, that blessed everybody, brothers and sisters. That absolutely went around this world in the Philippines, into India, into Africa. In Nigeria, I got a letter after the first videos went into this jungle place. Brother Jackson, the minute we showed this, it fell here. It wasn't long. The people were just, they were so drunk. And I have to say, brothers and sisters, I didn't do it. God was fulfilling something that he showed me. And I want to say this to my brothers. The last part of the dream, we've not come to it yet. But I know what it is. Because when I saw all these people coming from all parts of the world, and each one was carrying that little bottle of anointing oil, I looked back and I knew they all had the Holy Ghost. And we were all going to a building. And everybody that was a coming was in unity. Everywhere you heard these little groups of coming from the directions, they was talking about the things that God has showed them, that God has done. And here I was in that dream telling the people of Faith Assembly, see what I told you? They was, always, they was all coming with smiles, a look of happiness. And through that big glass doors of that building, I don't know where it's at. The building might just been a symbol. But everybody that was a coming, nobody was standing at the door looking for any kind of credentials. Everybody that came had the little bottle of oil. And that lets me know the bride's coming together because she was talking, fellowshipping, no enmity or anything. They was all saying the same things. And then, brothers and sisters, now your denomination will say, now there they go. See, that's spiritualism. Well, let me tell you, Mr. Methodist, you don't even know your Bible. In the process of time, Brother Branham appeared immediately, right on the stage in front of everybody. And then he opened his mouth, he began to say some things. And the things he was saying made me feel so happy. I was saying in a low tone of voice, what did I tell you? What did I tell you? Now, I don't think you're going to sit in a building somewhere and see the, the image of Brother Branham. 
But God can send that man's image to a ministry of men. And just as Jesus took Peter, James, and John upon the Mount of Transfiguration, did he not tell them down below, very, very, I said to you, there's some of you standing here that will not see death till you've seen the Son of Man coming in the power of his kingdom. He took Peter, James, and John upon the Mount of Transfiguration. And all of a sudden, the power of God came down, and in the midst, there was the image of Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah never spoke to the disciples. Moses and Elijah spoke to Jesus. Now, you Methodists and Baptists, that's not spiritualism. That's reality. But everything them the prophets said to Jesus concerning the death and the things he's going to suffer on the cross, them disciples heard it. There's a lot of Gentiles today the world over never knew Brother Branham in his actual earthly visual. How many understand me? But let's just say those seven thunders, whoever they are, I pray to God that you can get my point tonight. Them seven thunders are going to be in agreement with what I've said. Supposing God sends that prophet in a vision or a dream, and he begins to tell that servant, you go and tell the people such and such and such and such. He tells another, you go tell the people such and such and such. I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, it's going to be so simple and so enlightening. It's sure going to be exciting. And when that happens, brother and sister, it's going to be the last thing that God does when he closes his book and he's ready to take this church from this earth. How many understand? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I've stood here expressing these words, Lord. And I pray that, God, you will take them and use them. Lord, my motive is not to hurt anybody. But I pray that I can somehow or other shake up some mental attitudes that's got lost in excitement somewhere. Lord, bring them back to the Scriptures. Let them see themselves in the Scriptures. And lead e let each minister, Lord, see himself united with other men, willing to stand shoulder to shoulder, that together we can lift up the voice and say, all the same thing. I thank you, Lord, tonight for your grace. Bless my brothers and sisters. I ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> May the Lord bless you now, brothers and sisters. There is for thee, my children, the warnings for the days are coming. But there are many voices throughout the earth today, and many things are being said. And I say to my children tonight, open wide thine ears, so that thou mightest hear in those moments of time. If there's sincerity in thy heart, and the intent of thy inner being is that which is pleasing to me, 
I will cause a little voice to speak inwardly in thy soul. And thou shalt know by the whisper of my spirit that I am there by thy side to direct thee and to show thee the hour what is right and what is wrong. Praise the Lord tonight. Appreciate that word. Amen. Amen. I've never been a person in my life to be in the midst of causing controversy. Never. But there's a truth whenever it is presented that you must stand for. People see me sitting up here. They see Brother Bud sitting up here. I don't speak for Brother Bud, but I know the brother's heart. They see us sitting here. We either stand alongside of Brother Jackson in this truth, Because the thing about it is, people are seeing, they're watching. They're watching reaction. And you've never seen me whenever Brother Jackson has preached something that I seem surprised or acted in some way that, well, I don't know about this. It's not that I've always understood it. Exactly when he first said it, I'm not talking about tonight. I'm not talking about this morning. I'm talking about through the years. But you've never seen a reaction of surprise. Because what God can do in this hour with his people. Nobody, nobody run the aisles today. Nobody fell on the floor, but you and I have heard something. It would do us well to listen. Then everything will be well with us. And I'd like for Sister Carmen to come and sing that song, All is Well, with my soul. If she's available at this time, I would ask that she would come. Very beautiful song a man that wrote that had just got word that his family had been lost at sea his wife and his two daughters and he goes into the piano and he thinks what am I going to do and the voice says it is well and he sits down there at that piano and he writes that song. It's an old song, but something old don't lose its meaning if it's truth. And it is well tonight with what we've heard. And I thank the Lord for it. Sing this, sisters, only you can do.
one sound to be heard in praising and thanking our Lord. And as our voices are lifted up, let us sing, O oh, our God is good, and His mercy endureth forever. Truly. 